So as we go through Luke uh, chapter 4, I'll summarize what we went over last time. And uh, the tension is building after setting it up the stage for Luke's uh, 1 through 3. And remember, if I can remind you what was Luke 1 through 3 and 4 about, it was setting the stage about people telling everyone what Jesus is the Messiah, he's the Son of God. So we had, in the beginning, all those big announcements from Simeon and Anna and Zacharias, and we had John the Baptist and the Messiah's coming. And then remember, Jesus stood up in the temple to read, and he says in Isaiah, I have come to set the captives free, the prisoners free, and to preach the good news to the poor, right? And then he throws a demon out of a man, and uh, that was last time. And then he banishes satanic uh, oppression over the people. He heals all kinds of diseases. So the area of Galilee and Judea had massive healing, and one of the big ones was he healed Peter's mother-in-law with a fever and she gets up and serves them and right after that Peter fresh in his mind sees this and she is healed immediately from this fever and then serves them and then the next time we looked at this Jesus says Peter the crowds are so great I can't minister let me get in the boat and I can teach from the boat and then afterwards Peter, let's go fishing, and Peter the fisherman, Jesus the carpenter, he goes, um, I haven't caught fish all night, and but I'll do it at your will. And he catches a boatload and almost sinks his boat. And then he says that famous line, depart from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. He sees Jesus' deity. He masters not only demons, sickness, he has mastery as God over nature. So he gets all of these fish to get into the boat when he wants them to. And we said, in the, whole, in the presence of the holiness of God, what do you see? You see your own sinfulness in the presence of God. And then we talked about Isaiah says, woe is me, I am undone when he saw the glory of God. So in the presence of God, you have one response, which is, forgive me, Lord, for my sinfulness. I'm not worthy to be in your presence. And then God, to Isaiah, sends an angel, touches his lips with a coal, and says, your sin has departed from you. And then he goes and preaches a message that nobody listens to. And then we talked about John on the island of Patmos. He also saw Jesus, and uh, he falls on his feet overwhelmed, just like Daniel and Ezekiel. And then we said that Moses said, God, show me all your glory. And he says, you can't look at me face to face, but as I pass by, you can see my receding glory. And he puts him in a cleft of the rock. So in summary, I didn't get to this part, which is closing last week, which is a man's fears and moves away from God. God loves and draws near to man. Um, Isaiah feared he would be destroyed. Instead, he was called to preach. John feared he would be destroyed. Instead, he was called to write. Peter feared that he would be destroyed. Instead, he was called to preach along with his friends. You never have to be afraid to admit your sin. That's the point at which you must come to receive mercy. So when else did Peter witness Jesus' power over fish? Anybody want to answer that? Yes, he uh, created fish, two fish. He didn't like multiply the cells of the fish. He created brand new fish, right? And then I heard the word coin, right? Okay, so he says, Peter, they want us to pay the tax. I want you to go catch a fish, look in his mouth, and it'll have a coin. And I want you to pay with that coin, and it'll be just the exact amount for my tax and your tax, okay? And then he says to Peter a proverb, and you know what that proverb was? Sometimes it's 
He says, I didn't hear you, but I think here's what you said. He said, <clears throat> the, um, the kings of this earth tax their people. They don't tax their sons, the children, right? I'm God, I'm king. <laughs> I don't have to pay taxes, I own it all. But I'm the son, okay? But just so that we don't offend them, I'm going to pay the tax. Okay, I'm going to fulfill the law and pay their dues, right? In fact, he says, let's not offend them. Go to the sea, cast in a fish hook, take the fish that you catch. When you open its mouth, you'll find a coin. Take it, give it to them. For you and me, and we won't offend them. So guess what the next topic is that is right up my alley in the world of infectious disease. And despite this next topic, I've only had seen two cases in my entire life, so it's rare in the United States. And the answer is it's leprosy. So we're gonna see a leper come to Jesus for healing. And what is the leper's attitude? It's going to be utter desperation. I am dying in a secluded life, and if you will, you can heal me. So, if you want to know this leper's mentality, the word is desperate. And if you look up desperate, what does it mean to be desperate? It's feeling, showing, involving a hopeless sense. A situation is so bad as it be impossible to deal with. An act or attempt tried in despair when everything else has failed, having little hope of success. A situation extremely bad, serious, or dangerous. What does that look like? Well, here's one version of what this looks like, okay? And it says, a man with leprosy came to him, begged him on his knees, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Moved with compassion, Jesus reached out and touched him. I am willing, Jesus said, be healed instantly. The leprosy disappeared and the man was healed. And there he is. Uh, did you notice it says, when the man did this to him, it says he had compassion on him. Okay. Jesus is the ultimate role model to show compassion. For physicians, are you a compassionate physician? And um, you teach that to the student doctors, right? Except you can't lecture compassion to people. You have compassion. How did he do it? He actually could empathize and he was in all points tempted as we were yet without sin. So he felt man's humanity completely to identify with us. It says another time when Jesus had compassion. It says Jesus, when he came out, he sees a lot of people like you go on a mission field and you see this line of 400 people lined up for you to see, to take care of them medically, and it's crowded, and you look at the audience and what do you see? And it's like, everyone sees something different, right? And that's like, it says he saw these masses and it says he had compassion toward them. Why? Why did he, what was he thinking? He says, because they were a sheep not having a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. So when God, Jesus, looks at him, he sees these people are looking, searching, and nobody's giving them an answer. They're like sheep wandering around. Everyone has gone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of his all, Isaiah says, right? So here's the man. Now, um, I don't have the papers to hand out, but who would like to read Luke chapter 5, 12 through 16? You're up, man. Luke chapter 5, 12 through 16, and I'll put it up here for those who don't have a Bible in front of them. However, the reports from around concerning all the more, great multitudes 
Okay, do you see the um, irony or the paradox of this story? The leper who cannot come into Jerusalem, he has to yell, unclean, unclean. He has to cover his lips. He's secluded from anybody, family, friends. He is alone. He's in an isolated place. He may have fellow lepers with him, right? He comes to Jesus in a crowd, right? He heals the man, and now man can enter society. And then what does Jesus do? He goes into an isolated place. And then he's away from the crowds. And he tells the man, and Mark, if you read the story, it says, don't tell anybody that you're healed. Go to the priest. And why would he say that? Why did he say, don't tell anyone, go to the priest? Why would he do that? Just to make the offering of Moses for leprosy. Yes, so he's following the Old Testament rules of Leviticus. We need a certificate saying, I was unclean, I wasn't allowed to come into society. Thank you, I get my certificate, because you, the priest, are in power uh, in God's place, even though you're corrupt, and they're going to give him the certificate of cleanliness, right? And they're going to sacrifice and do all these things. And then he says, why does he say, don't tell anyone? Well, you already saw what he had to do. He had to get in a boat <laughs> to get away from the crowd. If you tell everyone, he can't minister. Instead, he has to go into isolated, deserted places because everywhere he goes, the crowds are too great. He can't even minister. So I like what this summary says. And I want you to see the, the appearance of leprosy and sin and how it looks it makes us disgusted when we look at it, not that we don't have compassion on the person, but losing your flesh and sin, it has a similarity. It says, uh, if you look at that whole process, he's healed the picture of a sinner's salvation. When somebody comes in true penitence to the Savior, Jesus gives them compassion. The leper had desperation. He was reverent. He was urgent. He was utterly humble. He was on his face, and he came in faith. I know you can heal me. Do you want to? And Jesus healed him. And like the desperate sinner coming to the Savior, he was cleansed. By the way, it says a lot of people were healed like the palsy man, but it says the leper was, it doesn't say he was healed, it says he was cleansed, but he was obviously healed too. So interesting that he was cleansed. And then um, like the prodigal son accepted back into the family, the sinner comes and is cleansed, he could re-enter a society and there would be a new relationship. Look at the picture of how that is, that you become a child of God and you can have fellowship with his children and you regain all those lost relationships. He could go back to family, friends, meet new people. He could re-enter society, he could go to the synagogue, he could go to Jerusalem. So what is leprosy? Uh, leprosy is called Hansen's disease. It's an infection of the skin and it likes the peripheral nerves, which means um, it likes the cold parts of your body, okay? So what are the cold parts of your body? Your ears, so your ears go, your nose goes, your nose is cold, okay? And then the nerves, as the nerve, the ulnar nerve wraps around right here, your funny bone, so when you bump it, it's like, oh, that hurts, right? That's where leprosy is gonna like. When that nerve dies deep into your body, no leprosy. So when it comes to the surface, there's leprosy. And this is a bacteria called myco, not micro, mycobacterium. And you know, you've heard of mycobacterium tuberculosis, right? Well, this is mycobacterium leprae, leprosy, okay? And if you go to old historical accounts, paleontology, digging up bodies, mummies, etc. They think it started in the area of Egypt because they had mummies with it. And that middle skull there has no parts of the nose and the palate and this person died, they can tell, of leprosy. And so where is leprosy right now in the United States? It's in Brazil and in India and in South, uh, the Indonesia area. It's in Africa. Notice the United States still has cases. And when you have leprosy, you lose your eyelashes, your mustache, your beard, 
You get these nodules, you get furrowing of your eyebrows, your ears get thickened, and what animal do you look like? An armadillo, that's coming, but you don't look like one, but I'll be talking about that in a minute. What animal do you look like? A lion, so they call it a leonine facies. Okay, you will see the lion in a minute, how it looks like that, but you must have read my next slide. Okay, <laughs> leprosy exists in armadillos. It's the only animal that you can grow leprosy in the foot pad of an armadillo, which of course you know it stretches from Texas and Florida. People who handle lep uh, armadillos have never left the state of Florida and have caught leprosy. However, you're not going to catch leprosy like that from an armadillo, so please don't kill all the, le the armadillos. You know. Now, of course, they dig under your house and in your bushes, and those tunnels drive you crazy. Uh, but, you know, that's, you're not going to catch it from le leprosy, although it's possible. Now, this is what a man looks like who has leprosy, and he does look like a lion with the furrows and the loss of hair and the nose gets thickened. And this is what it does to the skin. You get these nodules there. And then over time, the nose, the cartilage gives away, and your nose sort of sinks in. Then you have a hole where your nose used to be. Notice the mustache is going and the furrowing up here. And then because it's damaging the nerves, you can't feel. So you're constantly traumatizing your hands and feet because you can't feel. And so there's no pain. And then you start to lose your fingers and your toes. And then the leprosy affects the nerves. And then eventually you may have no hands and feet like this man. And then when it's in the nerves, you can actually see that nerve when it comes to the surface. And when it affects your hand, you have a claw deformity like this. And your leg has a nerve, and you can see it there. And it causes these white patches. Now, what's the closest thing we have to leprosy and how, if you see this, you think, oh no, this person's highly contagious. I can't touch them, I would catch leprosy. So the closest we have to that is called Norwegian scabies. And by the way, the word leprosy means scale. And so when they say there's leprosy in the Bible, including on a garment or a building, a house, it's not leprosy, the bacteria, it's a scaly looking stuff on your clothes, your house, or your skin. So leprosy in the Bible is not always mycobacterium leprosy. It's a scaly thing. And this person has a scaly thing. This, is, this gentleman has scabies, which are small little microbes, millions of them. And if you touch him, you can catch scabies. Okay, so uh, nurses, doctors, when they take care of someone with this, you have to give them a pill to kill the scabies because they didn't know the person had it for several weeks until they diagnose it. And then when a baby gets it, that's what scabies looks like. And you see that crusty, scaly skin and the skin flakes falling off and the bacteria are there. Now, the president in the past of the Christian Medical Dental Association was David Stevens. He wrote a book called Jesus MD. And in his book, he wrote, when he was in Africa, Kenya, doing mission work for 10 or 12 years, when AIDS first started, he was there, and the local African people working the nursing jobs and others wouldn't take care of a guy that had AIDS because they thought, I'm going to catch AIDS taking care of him. And so he, as the doctor, he took his coat off, and he goes in there, and he starts cleaning the man and touching him and cleaning his body from all the filth. And all of a sudden, the locals felt ashamed that this doctor is doing my job, cleaning this guy up. So then they came in, and he, he illustrated what Jesus did, which is Jesus just touched him, and, he, and that would just, they couldn't believe he would touch him. Nobody would ever touch him. And so he transcends it. Nowadays, this is what it looks like when you catch Ebola. Nobody wants to touch you because they can catch it, and you get put in this, and you're like isolated with layers of stuff away from you. 
Now, you didn't come here to hear a medical talk, right? But I had to set the stage. So what does the Bible teach about leprosy? Um, did you know that David, when he was cursing Joab for killing Abner, and later on he says in his curse, he goes, in Deuteronomy 5.2, if you find, or excuse me, in 2 Samuel 3.29, he says, this is talking, David talking about um, Joab, the general, may his house never be without a leper. So that's obviously a curse. Okay, that is an ultimate curse right there. But in Deuteronomy, it says, if anybody has leprosy, put them out of the camp, and that's where you go outside. You can't come in until you're declared key, or clean. So uh, everyone believes that leprosy is the perfect view of sin and what it looks like. This is what a leper colony would look like. You could only go to some isolated place where only lepers were. Uh, here's uh, the leper coming at Jesus, and, and Jesus touches him, okay? So what are the laws of leprosy? The priest um, has to pronounce you unclean. You are now separated, and then you have to come to the priest to come back and offer the sacrifices, so you stay out of the camp until then. And then when you think of leprosy, you think of corruption, decay, and it says in Leviticus, all the days wherein the plague shall be in him, he shall be defiled, that is leprosy. He's unclean, he shall dwell alone without the camp, that's where he should be. And Leviticus says, of the body, a burn on its skin by fire, the raw flesh, the burn becomes a bright spot, a red, red white spot, and the priest examines it, and then the hair, if it looks like it's turning white, then he's unclean, it's a leprous sore. So they told him, how can you find leprosy? Now, if you want a great book to read, I recommend uh, Paul Brand spent his 40 years in a leper, taking care of lepers in India, and he wrote a book called Pain, the Gift Nobody Wants. In other words, if you have leprosy, you can't feel pain and it damages your body. Uh, and then he also wrote, the Ten Fingers for God, okay, they lose their fingers. His wife was a physician, an eye doctor, and she wrote a book about visions for God. And then you can read about their whole story, Paul and Margaret Brand, and how they took care of lepers as Christians and wrote a lot of books. In fact, their most famous book with Paul Brand was fearfully and wonderfully made. A surgeon looks at the human and spiritual body and shows you that you can't look at the human body and say, oh, there's no creator. Okay, that was the point of what this book and in his image. Now, where would you find a leprosarium in the United States? If you had leprosy, where would you go in the United States? What state? Louisiana. Louisiana. What city or location? Carvel. Here's the leper colony which uh, they used to have leprosy patients there. And this is what their clinic looked like. They have since closed it down as far as people staying there, but they still have, in Carvel, Louisiana, they still have this uh, place where they take care of it. And they say, Carvel's cures, when they came up with treatment for leprosy. And then um, historically, if you look in Leviticus, it says, a leprous person, so not only are you away from society, here's what you have to do. It says a leprous person must wear torn clothes, your hair has to hang loose, you have to cover your lip. Every time you come across people, you have to say, unclean, unclean, and that stays there as long as you're diseased and you're outside the camp. And uh, you may not die for 20, 30 years as it slowly eats up your body. So, that's not a good disease to have, is it? Okay? Now, when you are cured, what do you get? Now you can enter society. This is a 1897 Certificate of Freedom from Leprosy. You have been examined by a doctor who says, you are now free of leprosy. You can enter society. You're not a public menace. And then think about that certificate. What verse does it say that Jesus gave us a certificate? We are free of sin or cured. What verse? The certificate. 
Okay, it's Colossians 2 to 14. It says, he, he, took, he went to the cross, blotting out the handwritten writing of ordinance that was against us, which was contrary to us. He took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. So, when it says, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, that was his sentence. Our sentence on handwritten of ordinances, my sin in God's eyes has this, here's my accusation, and Jesus nails it to the cross and pays it. I like this one. It says, one cross, if you're a mad person, plus three nails equals forgiven. That's a good one. Okay? Now, who in the Bible had leprosy? Miriam, thank you. Who else? Who? Naaman, excellent. We got two. Uzziah, we got three. Good. Uh, when did Moses get leprosy? That'll really test your brain. There he is. Good. So God says, okay. Moses says, God, I can't go get somebody else. I can't speak. He goes, look, here's what you're going to do. You're going to throw this stick down, and then it'll become a snake. And then he goes, put your hand in your coat. He does, and he goes, pull it out. Leprosy. He goes, wow. And then he goes, put it back in. And he goes, and it's, now it's normal. But he never uses it, by the way. Okay, so that was when Moses had a temporary batch of leprosy. What does that look like? I don't know. That's one example. Okay? So there's Moses looking at his leprosy hand. Okay? All right. And then you said Miriam, right? So why did Miriam get leprosy? Because she led the dance in the golden calf this year. Well, that was close, but it wasn't that event. She, uh, she and Aaron went to Moses. There it is. That's the picture. Thank you. Okay, so... Um, Miriam, by the way, think about this. Moses is little brother, right? Miriam is older sister. Aaron is the next in line, right? So your little brother's getting all this accolade, acclaim, and Miriam and, and Aaron, with Miriam being the instigator, why does he get to go to God and do all this stuff? We're just like him. You know, we can get this stuff too. And God says, okay, Miriam, Aaron, Moses, come up to me. And he says, look, when I want to talk to someone face to face, I go to Moses, okay? So don't you tell, talk bad about Moses. He's the meekest man on earth. And he says, to punish you, Miriam starts turning leprosy. And Aaron goes, oh, please, Moses, pray for her. And then Moses says, falls on his face and says, God, please clear her leprosy. And then um, God says what to Moses? He uses a Jewish story. He goes, if she had stood in my face and offended me like that, shouldn't she at least for seven days be wait outside the camp? So that was left her. She says, God says, I'm not going to cure her like that. She's going to sit outside the camp for seven days, and you're not going to move until she's seven days are up. And then she comes back, and her leprosy is cured. So that was an example of judgment, right? And there's. Miriam, and there's Uzziah, and what did Uzziah the king do to get leprosy? Another judgment. What did Uzziah do to get leprosy? Okay, Uzziah is a king. He's in the lineage of Judah, even though Jesus comes from that lineage. He's not in the lineage of Levi, and he goes and he starts offering incense at the altar where only Levi is allowed to go. And he's from Judah, he's a king. And they immediately push him out of there, and he's not gonna go, so he's getting really mad, and all of a sudden leprosy breaks out, and now we have leprosy in God's holy location, and now he readily gets out of there. And guess what he dies with? He dies with leprosy. He never totally was cured or repented, okay? so. And why did this happen to him? Pride got Uzziah. It says, but after Uzziah became powerful, his pride led to his downfall. So unfortunately, this is the 
story of Uzziah. It says, the king was a leper until the day of his death. He dwelled in a house set apart, being a leper, for he was cut off from the house of the Lord. And then they even found a old um, tablet saying about that. Now, who else was killed for coming before God, not in compliance in the known and proper way? Yes, a couple guys. Their names are uh, Nadab and Abihu were killed for offering strange fire before the God, and that was the oldest two sons of Aaron. So you have to come with God in a certain way. Why was the man without a wedding garment denied entrance to the wedding and actually was in the wedding part? He was in the congregation. And the king, who's giving the party for the wedding, uh, has the man come out and says, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And the man is speechless. And he says, bind him up and throw him where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Why did the man without the wedding garment get treated like that in the parable? You didn't come prepared in what way? You are correct, but he wasn't prepared in what way? Okay, he came with his filthy clothes and his own righteousness, and the king, looking around, gave everybody the gowns of righteousness. He's not wearing one, and he throws them out, okay? So it says, when the king came in to see the guest, he saw there a man who had not on a wedding garment, and the essentials of the wedding garment is Christ righteousness imputed to you and so get him out of here and he'll be thrown out where there's weeping and wild gnashing of teeth what does he need he needs the wedding garment which is Christ gives us his righteousness to clothe us with it right all right so what's your problem how does this happen it says here's what Paul says he says I want to be found in him not having my own righteousness which what he was doing before knowing Christ, right? In his pharisaical tradition, he goes, I want to be not in my own righteousness, which is of the law, but I want to, through faith of Christ, get the righteousness which is of God by faith. Okay. Another leprosy person is Naaman. So here's the cartoon of that in summary. And when we think about lepers, Lessons from healing of Naaman the leper. Sin like leprosy in the Bible is incurable by man. Sin like leprosy is loathsome and defiling. Sin causes separation, and unless it's cured, it causes death. So that was leprosy. Now, there's another story in the Bible where there's ten lepers. This is later on in Luke. In Luke. So he heals one leper a couple times, but now he has 10 lepers coming to him and they want him to heal them. And he touches the leper and all of them. And he says, I want you to go to the priest and show yourself to them. So who can read Luke 17, 11 through 19? If we have another reader who's fast at getting to the Bible verse. It has a strong voice. Anybody want to read Luke 17, 11 through 19? I didn't see. Yes, sir. Sorry. And it came to pass as he went to Jerusalem, he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered into a certain village, there met he ten men that were lepers and stood far off. And they lifted up their voices said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go show yourselves to the priests. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, he saw that he, he was healed, turned back, and with a loud voice glorified God, and fell down on his face at his feet, giving thanks, and he was a Samaritan. Jesus answering said, Were not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? There are not found that return to give glory to God save this 
strength. And he said unto him, Arise, go thy way. Your faith has made you whole. Thank you. So we don't know what happened to the nine Jewish people's faith, but they didn't come back to give him thanks. But this Samaritan, who is not um, part of the Jewish people, and he's an outcast already as a Samaritan, and now he's a double outcast with leprosy, it says, your faith has made you well. And, and if you want a picture of this, here he is realizing, I need to go back and thank him. And it was the Samaritan who comes at his feet and says, thank you. And then what does Jesus say to him? It says, we're not all cleansed. Where are the nine? That's a rhetorical question. Why is this one man coming? Where are the nine? Was there no one found to return and recognize and give thanks and praise to God except this alien, this foreigner? And then in Jesus's Matthew version of our first story, I like to know that it says, if you are willing, and Jesus says, I am willing. And so that was a great question. The way he posed it, he goes, if you're willing, I know you can heal me, but you have to decide if you want to heal me. God says, I am willing, let's heal you. So I love that approach where he gets that healing. Uh, one other leper story. Did you know that um, Jesus was, a Mary, was anointed by Mary in what home? Simon the leper. Well, that means Simon the leper couldn't be in his house because he had leprosy. So Simon the leper must have been cleansed from leprosy. So therefore, Simon was probably healed by Jesus. And Jesus is eating in a leper's home. And that's where Mary anoints him for his death and burial. And then Judas says, why this waste? And then ultimately, after seeing that, what does he do? He goes to betray Jesus and wants 30 pieces of silver. And so that was the last leper story that we hear about. Now, Van, can you um, play a song for us? We can all stand up to sing.